like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Ramizia here, our uh, Consul General in Melbourne, Pak uh, President Mama Aswan, uh, Isan President Parani Amdan, our Maska uh, representative Zahim, and all of us all of you here today. Thank you very much for coming and listening to me speak. My topic today is about globalization. Are we in Malaysia leaders or followers? So, can I all be here? here? So I'd like to start with, um, actually before I go into globalization and all that, I'd like to speak about um, this opportunity here that we have in Melbourne. Now Melbourne is a fantastic place because we have so many Malaysians here and we have many uh, Malaysians of different ages different demographics, different backgrounds, and I can't help to recall um, before we achieved Merdeka back in 57, uh, in London, most of the leaders that led the next three decades were all friends, were all in, in um, discussion with one, intense discussion with one another, debating, not, not only debating, but um, exchanging ideas, inspiring one another. And this, this generation of Malaysians, uh, exemplified by Tunku Rahman, Tun Abdul Raza, and actually they were actually friends with people like Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, because they were all from the same region. They weren't, they weren't the entities of Malaya or Singapore and all that back then. And they were all students, and they were all in their 20s, early 20s, mid 20s. Uh, Tun Raza, for example, was a brilliant brilliant student, he completed his um, LLB in 18 months, as I recall. Um, and that, that uh, group of people led the future of Malaysia. And in Melbourne, we have such a diverse crowd, and there's so many talented uh, Malaysians, and many of them are in this room, actually, who are very talented Malaysians who uh, have a lot of passion for the future uh, of the country. So. We can use this opportunity and freedoms we have in Melbourne to engage with one another. Um, and it's about acceptance of um, different points of view and seeing how we can cooperate and, and learn from one another. And this is the kind of spirit we want to take back to Malaysia, where in the past decade or so we've seen a lot of um, the discourse being very, very polarized. And it doesn't need to be polarized. We can actually lead the discussion in the sense that we can lead the conversation to be more inclusive and more um, holistic in a sense. So when it comes back to the topic of globalization, are we leaders or followers? They are very different. Uh, I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a lawyer, I'm, not, I'm just an architect, urban designer. But when, when I look at the, the word globalization, there are many levels where Malaysia participates in um, the globalization process or the globalization discourse. Now, one of the things that Malaysia has, uh, is very, um, what do you call it, prominent in. I have like 10, 20 calls now, because we're say going on in an hour. But um, one of the things we are very good at at the moment is we are a very lucky country in the sense that not only do we have natural resources, but we are actually a very young demographic country. We have 60% of the population under the age of 30. Now, when you have 60% of the population under the age of 30, and you compare it to countries like Singapore and Japan, we are much better off than those countries. In the sense that, in Japan, if you are starting your first job, when do you graduate? In, after the university degree, 22, 23? 23. 23. A 23-year-old Japanese um, graduate, first he has trouble finding a job because unemployment is very high. When he finally secures a job, the taxes he's paying supports six um, uh, older Japanese people because they have a very imbalanced um, what you call it, demographic now where they have a very big population of baby boomers, those who were born after World War II, who are now in their 60s, 70s, closer to their 80s, some of them. And then they have uh, people who are, you know, the young demographic, the birth rate now is about one per couple. So if you imagine two people come together, you only have one child. So that's why in Japan, the young people have the highest suicide rates in the world because when they are faced with all this and they leave university and they come up to, to work, 
it's hard to get a job, it's hard to advance in life, and it's very bleak because after the tsunami, they saw that, hey, I have to support six other people, and then there's this economy that's going to tank anytime. And that's the kind of dilemma they're facing. In Singapore, yesterday I heard on the radio a professor from the NUS talking about um, uh, in Singapore, they have an issue with uh, by 2025, their population, their young population will be approaching the same sort of situation in Japan, where, they have, where the birth rate in Singapore is very low. So each family, they'll have at the most two and a half children. That's the demographic. Two and a, I'm not saying there's half a person, but <laughs> you know, two and a half children per, per couple in Singapore. So in that sense, in 2025, the situation between Malaysia and Singapore might be very, very different in the sense that we have a more balanced sort of population. And when we come and look at that, well, there's a lot of hope for the future. And a lot of people are saying that there is no hope, there's, it's a very bleak future in Malaysia, but I do believe there's a lot of hope in the future. But this hope is pinned upon how we, the young people in Malaysia, respond to the challenges ahead of us. Um, we are a very creative society in Malaysia. We have a lot of uh, energy. When you have a country with a lot of young people, you have a lot of energy. And what's lacking in Malaysia is because, because of the current uh, social demographics in Malaysia, where uh, about 40 people do not earn more than, 40% of the population do not earn more than 1,500 ringgit. This is per family, by the way. So we are actually not at the level where, like Australia, Australia is a very developed society in the sense that it's you know, minimum wage, at least if you work somewhere here, you get at least, at the very least, $14 an hour. So a lot of my friends who finish school in Australia, they can take um, one year out and say, hey, look, I'm going to Europe, I'm going to travel the world, and I'm going to come back and do my uni after a year. In Malaysia, we don't have that opportunity because of you know this income disparity. But what we do have is a lot of young people, and we can actually uh, do things together, try and change the discourse, try and try and um, activate ourselves, and and uh, contribute through social media, through the internet, and things like that. There are a lot of movements happening in Malaysia, which are very very interesting. I mean. Uh, Two weeks ago, we had Edmund Bond come here with um, Undi Malaysia, and he was discussing youth ac youth action groups. And these action groups do so many things. Not just uh, the most prominent things they do. Some of them, not all of them, are things like um, they are now campaigning for things like Occupy Datara, which a lot of people is contentious issue in Malaysia. Where are these things good? Are these things bad? I'm not going to answer that today. I can probably if you want to ask me and we can discuss it in question and answer. But the other things they're doing, they're going into villages, urban, middle class Malaysians, young Malaysians, going into villages, trying to understand where they can be of assistance, how they can inspire. Things like programs such as Teach, of, Teach for Malaysia. You ever Teach for Malaysia? These are youth um, activated sort of initiatives that contribute back to the country. And because of this energy that the young people have, uh, and because of how borderless the world is, and the opportunities we have here in Melbourne, by studying here alone, uh, you have access to people of various cultures, various backgrounds, nationalities, and the network you can build uh, in Australia will benefit you for years and years to come when you go back to Malaysia. So, are we leaders or followers in globalization? I say we are potentially leaders in globalization because not because of um, just because we have this 60% young population in Malaysia but because we here in Melbourne for example we have the access to the education we have access to information we have access to networks of contacts and things like that if we can be activated when we go back to Malaysia and keep this situation of um, or this environment of discourse, of positive discourse, and spread this sort of culture back in Malaysia, it really, really helps change the tra trajectory of where we're going in Malaysia. And really, the leaders of globalization is all of us, the young, the young people. 